I still have flashbacks and scared the hell out of my wife in bed. You know, you tear off your T-shirt or something. It's realistic, you know, just like looking at you guys. It's in technicolor and uh, you have the memories, they don't go away. Hi, I'm Greg Columbus. honored to be joined today by U.S. Navy veteran Ron Scharf. He's also a veteran of World War II and the Battle of Iwo Jima. And sir, thank you very much for being with us. You're welcome, sir. Where were you born and raised? Born and raised in Chicago. When did you join the service? I uh, had a little trouble. I'd use uh, bleach to try and change my uh, age on my uh, birth certificate. And uh, the recruiter would say, hey, Rondo, uh, come back in a couple of years when you're old enough. And my sister got married at uh, one of the Catholic churches, and I speared a bunch of baptismal certificates off the altar. And that way you can make it any age you wanted. So uh, I talked my mom and dad into, you know, I said, hey, they won't be sending me overseas till I'm 18. Uh, I was in the States about three months, and uh, I was heading for Ewell. Uh, I think I everyone in here so far lied about their age to get into the service. Talk about why it was so critical for you to get in before well, you turned 18. You were gung-ho. You know, your country, you wanted to do something for your country. You know, and back then, everything's an adventure. So, uh, hey, you wanted to do what you wanted to do, and that's that's how things are different. You know, like today's, today's generation is totally night and day different. Want the best of everything. They don't care what it costs, and they want it now. <laughs> but uh, so much for that. Every every generation is different, you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So then, uh, on the way uh, heading over to the different islands, uh, after we got going, uh, a couple of our coxswains got killed, and the skipper uh, called me up and said, "Rondo, I like the way you handle the boats. You know, the LCBPs, the Higgins boats. He said, Do you want to be a coxswain?" I said, yes, sir, you know, so everything was an adventure. So he says, okay, you're, you're a coxswain. So that, that, that started it off. I'm cutting a lot of stuff out because it would take hours to tell you. Well, just tell me real quick uh, why you joined the Navy and, and, and uh, how you trained to be a coxswain. Uh, well, we trained down in uh, Camp Bradford. Uh, it was in uh, West Virginia. And, uh, you know, you went out in, uh, in the bay and they... They run you around on the boats and stuff like that, and you got to handle it pretty good. And like I say, everything everything back then was an adventure anyway. And uh, that was that was that was pretty much it. Training that was your training, amphibious training. We uh, we got the patch, the red one with the Thompson and the anchor on that on there, and that's uh, uh, seals patch today. They took our patch, yeah. So well, you're you're proud of what you were doing, you know. That was pretty much it. I remember one time it was it was really funny. The, uh, the, the bosun's mate was standing there, and we're all standing out in line. And he says, uh, hey, I need some volunteers for dive bombers. So I said, geez, that sounds exciting. So I said, <laughs> so I step out, and a couple of guys step out, you know. And they hand you a pole with a 16-penny nail, and you go around picking up cigarette butts. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. Um, and then... Uh, they had another deal to volunteer for. You stepped out, and the guy said, hey, kid, come back in a couple of years. <laughs> and I says, uh, you don't want to do this. That was for U uh, UDT, Underwater Demolition Team, frogmen back then. Yeah. So that was that was pretty much it in camp, you know, in, in training. So was Iwo Jima your first combat action? Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. What were you thinking as you were about to begin the, the operation? Well, you know... You got to keep your, your three o'clock in the morning, they offer you steak and eggs. Who the hell can eat? Nobody can eat, you know. So the thing is, the guys were all on edge. And uh, I had to get my boat alongside. And I got the cargo nets over the side of the LSC. I got to get my boats alongside, and the guys are falling in. They're dropping their carbines, and I'm trying to keep it throttled down so I can keep it up against the side. We load up, and we start heading in, you know. Took us, took us a while to get in. Got in there about nine o'clock in the morning on the first wave, and we we're heading in. I had a full throttle. Had a full throttle, and uh, next thing I know, uh, we hit an obstruction on the beach at the UDT 
underwater demolition team didn't take out. I go over the top of the wheel, smash my horn on the jarhead's helmet in front of me and knock my teeth out. Plus, I couldn't breathe and uh, your nose is broken, you're bleeding. So I ended up down on a tank deck down there and I couldn't breathe and I kept telling myself, um, I'm only 16, I can't be having a heart attack. It's it, it's not a heart attack. So the guys uh, pulled me out through the front because our bar door was down and all the rest of the guys are in 14 foot of water, a lot of them are drowning. And uh, I lean over the side. I, I was trying to catch my breath and try and breathe. And uh, the blood from my nose is going right on this guy's glasses. He's got his arms up. And I can't uh, can't help him. And I was just telling myself that, you know, I'm not having a heart attack. So the guys pull me up on a beach. First, first guy they pull me through is the uh, first dead guy I ever see. He's, is in two pieces, pull you through him and get up on a beach and you're waiting for the corpsman to come and get you. So that took took a while, but those are the greatest guys in the world, the corpsman. I mean, they, they, pull, they pull me through. So on they get you down on one of the LSTs and get you up in sick bay and work on you, and that's pretty much it. But uh, I'm not a pill popper. You're Stuff doesn't go away. Your memories, you know, your eyes, your eyes are a picture to the world, and your brain takes the memories. You never forget them. So sometimes, you know, about once a month or so, uh, after all these years, I, I still have flashbacks and scared the hell out of my wife in bed. You know, you tear off your t-shirt or something. But that's, uh, it's realistic. You know, just like looking at you guys. It's in Technicolor and. Uh, you have the memories, they don't go away. Oh, hey, we did what we had to do, and I'd do it all over again. Talk about loading the guys up a little more. How many guys could you fit in here? 30, 36 guys in my boat. We lost 15 guys out of 36. And, and uh, yeah, slow boat, but, I mean, did the job. Like old Eisenhower said, uh, Higgins' boats won the war. You did say that. You're absolutely yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How far from shore was the obstruction that you hit? About 14, 15, 18 feet, somewhere around there, yeah. Okay. And uh, were the Japanese firing at that point, or is that... No, they were waiting for us to get up on the beach. And then yeah, they, had, uh, they had 55-gallon drums lined up on a beach full of gasoline. They were going to torch them off when we got it, when we hit the beach. But uh, our Navy choristers and uh, Hellcats came by and rebarbed the beach and set them off. So it was so much. I went back there last year and uh, still seen one of the old 55 gallon drums that were all still puffed there. out and blown up. You know, and I took, took a picture with it. Yeah, it was kind of memorable. Wow. Now, when you were on the beach waiting for the corpsman and waiting to be evacuated back to the, the, the ship, um, was there any combat happening then? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Were, so just were, describe that atmosphere. That had to oh, be. Oh, Horrific. Picking the guys off because they went for the corpsmen's all the time, you know. The corpsmen, did, they'd pack a forty-five and they'd take their armbands off. So, uh, you know, because they went, they went, they wanted to get a corpsman because he could, uh, he could take care of a lot of guys, you know. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was going to it. You just, you, 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 you didn't know what the hell was going on. Everything was so, such a cluster, you know. But I mean, it was. Uh, you just waited and did what you had to do and kept trying to breathe. <laughs> How long did it take you to finally catch your breath? I didn't. Until yeah, you were back until on until they got until they got you on an LSC in a sick bay, start taping you up and shooting you shooting you full of juice, you know. But, you really got the wind knocked out of you. No, it wasn't a wind. It split open your sternum. Split your sternum open. You cracked your you broke your sternum. Yeah, you split your sternum open. Yeah, that's why you couldn't breathe. It, was, it wasn't just getting knocked out of, out of breath. You know? So that, that's what had me so damn scared, you know. Wow. I was thinking, geez, I'm freaking having a heart attack, you know. But wasn't that wasn't it. How long did it take to recover from that? A uh, couple of days there. And then, yeah, a couple of days. Wow. And then they now tape, when, tape you, you up and put you out on the beach as a beach master to hold up the plaques and tell, show the guys where they're going. Well, we'll get to that in just a second. Yeah. But... Uh, 
when you're still waiting to be evacuated, did you have any sort of cover? Were you behind a, a no, rock you're or laying, any obstruction? No, you're laying on the beach. Just you're wide like, open. Yeah, you, you crawl over one side and you slide down two feet. <laughs> No, no, there was nothing. There was so were you, on, were you on the ash that everyone talks about? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah black sand. Black sand. Black sand. You take one step forward and two steps back. Yeah. Or you roll one way and you roll back. So two days later, you're yeah. back in the game. Yeah, they had me all taped up and shot up and stuff. And I'd sit out on the beach and help the beach master hold up a sign and do this. Or... Who were you directing at that point? Anybody coming in. Yeah, anybody, any of the landing craft, any of the guys getting in there. Was it, so it was personnel and material? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Tanks and half tracks and jeeps, whatever, yeah. Wow, and and was there still, at, at that point, had the Japanese pushed off the beach? No, hell no. You're no, still getting no, fired no. on? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're getting fired at, yeah, for sure. How are you protecting yourself? You <laughs> just, <laughs> whatever you had to do, no. No, it was, it was starting to calm down, though. It was starting to calm down. They were pushing them back. So we were, we were okay. We were all right. <laughs> it's Everybody, hard to imagine being shot at and thinking you're okay, but uh, I guess <laughs> it was less intense than it had been a day or two well, earlier. Hey, you know, it's always the next guy. It's always the next guy. And then you think, Jesus, you know, am I going to check out here? <laughs> but it's always the next guy you're worried about, yeah. Right. So did you stay in that same area then for the duration of the battle as stuff no, came ashore? No, I stayed there. Oh, we were there about seven, eight days, and we took off for Okinawa. Okay. We did the invasion April April Fool's Day? We did Okinawa. Okay. Well, let's talk about that. Same role, I assume. Uh, yeah. Same, same, same thing. Yeah. Same okay. Thing, did that landing go a little smoother? Uh, no. It was. It was. They were. They were nailing at us for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about then we, it. Then we got up on the beach. Well, we got up on the beach there, and uh, back then there was a lot of Guamanians, I mean, uh, Okinawans. And uh, Okinawans look a lot like the Japanese do. And uh, we'd be, uh, after it started calming down a little bit, there were still snipers. Um, we are standing out in front one evening, you know, after things started calming down, We'd all stand in a big row and shoot in the breeze, and the guys would always pinch you a little bit, you know, on the butter or on the back or something. And I'm, I'm on the end, and uh, I feel something right here, you know, on my, my right side, and uh, I, I turn around, there's nobody there. So I go like this, and I got a little blood on my hand. It was a sniper taking a, taking a shot at us out on the beach. And uh, just caught you a little bit, you know, no big deal. But uh, it was uh, that that night we uh, uh, they were creeping up because we had our tank on an LST. You got the big bow doors open, and uh, a bunch of them had crept up along with the shrubbery and everything like that. And there was about thirty six of them, and uh, we had to waste them. You know, I was, so the next morning he got up, we counted 36 of them. And, uh, you know, those men, women, children, they're guys, gooks, gals with the satchel charges in their kimonos. They were going to try and throw them in on the tank deck. But uh, yeah, well, the next morning we counted 36 of them. So, you know, you had to do what you had to do. Right. So back to Iwo Jima for a moment, Mr. Scharf. You mentioned you were back on the beach a couple days after uh, you had hit the obstruction on, yeah. on the first wave. So were you able to see the flag raising? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was yeah, that moment like? That came off the USS Missoula. That's where I live now. Missoula, Montana. Yes, sir. Yeah, that, that came off there, yeah. What was that moment like to see that? Oh, I was, I was pretty ch chilling, you know. I mean, you, you really felt jubilant about it you know you felt felt great you know that we would get the flag up there yeah because yep. you were you were tired tired of seeing the meatball <laughs> <laughs> now a lot of folks of course have assumed that once the flag got raised the battle had been won but obviously it went on for another month no way yeah, yeah. it went on for a good month after that yeah yeah that must have helped morale though quite a bit oh yeah it did yeah for sure for sure yeah and uh 
you know, it's, it, it's memories you have and they never go away. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're good memories and bad memories. So, uh, that's so pretty. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, back to Okinawa then. Um, how long were you there? Ah, oh, jeez. I don't know, probably two weeks, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And just sorties back and forth, bringing guys in. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, what we were doing, we, I was up on a beach, and I wasn't, I wasn't driving a Higgins boat anymore because I was still kind of patching up, you know. Right. I still didn't feel that great. For two years after that, I didn't feel great. That's a major injury. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It it, it took took a good two years. It took a good two years to kind of heal up. You'd roll over the wrong way in bed, and you could feel it, you know. Mm. But uh, how would you describe the ferocity of the Japanese soldier? Hell of a tough dude, yeah. Hell of a tough little guy, yeah. They could sit and squat for hours and hours and hours. But you try it for a while, and your old knees start to go on you. Yeah, they were they were they were tougher than hell. Yeah, and they would never give up. No, no, no there, was, there was no giving up. That's what they believed in. It's night and day between uh, my generation and your generation and the younger guys now. I don't. You don't have a real lot when you're talking. They don't understand what you're talking about sometimes, and I don't understand what they're talking about. But there's a big generation gap in between there. Well, definitely, yeah. Oh, the percentage yeah. the percentage of people in younger generations that have served is tiny compared yeah. to to well, your generation. You know, I, after, after I got out, I took the test. I checked, run around, and checked out the chicks for a couple of years, <laughs> and uh, then I uh, decided to get on the fire department back in Chicago, and uh, that was that was the best move I made because. When I was when I was overseas, the guys were all in college and in school, and you come back, you didn't have anything in common with them. So uh, it was it was a good career. Yeah, I, the way I look at it, you know, sometimes I'll talk in high school and say, "How many guys? How many of you guys are 16 years old?" You know, and would would do something like that. Oh, none, 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 none of them. You know, and uh, it's 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 different, night and day, night and day for sure. But I, I figure uh, I've taken lives and I've saved lives. I got three saves behind me. I got a little girl and two women over a period of 22 years in the fire department. So I feel good about it, you know. Can't be all bad. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, what does it mean to you to have served? Pardon me, sir? What does it mean to you to have served at such critical battles as well, first of all, Iwo Jima. I'm really proud of it. Yeah, I'm really proud of it because there's not too many of us guys left. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I guess I'm the youngest guy yet. Uh, that was on Iwo. There was a guy that was 15, so I was 16 and a half. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, it, I'm proud of it. You know, and still be above ground, and you have you have, you have your memories, but uh, I'm still proud. I do it all over again. You mentioned you'd go around and talk to kids from time to time at schools and so forth. Yeah, they'll call me up and ask me to come over. What's the most important thing you want them to know? War's not fun. It's real. Uh, just try and do the best you can and keep your country first. I mean, it, it bothers me if somebody doesn't take their hat off when we're playing the Star Spangled Banner or if they try and desecrate the flag or something like that, I'm going to stop them. Because too many guys paid the supreme sacrifice for so that they can live. And uh, the flag, flag is everything. That's our country, the greatest country in the world. So uh, that's, that's what you live with and uh, that's what you die with. What does it mean to you to gather with your fellow veterans and in addition to remembering what you did, to pay tribute to those who did not come home? Uh, I got a story on that one. I was, I was standing in the graveyard on Iwo and uh, I lost uh, a couple of buddies of mine. And, uh, I was standing over their grave, over Frank and Nick's grave, and I told them, I said, you know, you guys, uh, I've lived a great life. I've had a beautiful wife and I have five good kids. And uh, 
why don't you guys come up and live my life that I've lived for the last upteen years. And, but, uh, you know, you'll get a chance to see how I lived and how things are up and up top side here. And I said, but I'll go down there and I'll stay down there for, for a long weekend. And don't forget, you guys don't go AWOL on me, though. You, you come back up, I'll, I'm not going to stay down here. So that that's pretty realistic what, uh, what I was thinking when I was standing there or down in the grave. So that, that's pretty much what it is. So they got a chance. Mr. Scharf, uh, yeah. 75 years. Last question here. 75 yeah. years. Uh, what does it mean to you that uh, there's so much recognition now for what you and your fellow veterans did that day? Well, if you don't hear from the horse's mouth, you're not going to get it. We were all sitting on Guam one time, 20 of us, and uh, the guy said, you know, we never talked about it. Now that's all we do is talk about it. But I mean, if if the younger generation and the people in, in the world today don't hear about it now from the horse's mouth, you're not gonna know. Because they don't teach it in school anymore. It's all kind of fluffed over. But uh, we're, we're all proud of what we did and we can do it all over again. And uh, I'm glad to be above ground and still here. I got another 19 years to go, so you guys look for me. I'll be 112, and uh, I can do it. That's your <laughs> so, goal? Mate, that's my goal. I got a good good altitude. I can do it. Excellent. You got to stay in shape. Oh, well, you're looking to be in fantastic shape. So uh, hey, You got to do what you got to do, boy. Congratulations on that. Thank you very much, sir, for your time with us today, and most of all, for your service to our country. Thanks for doing the interview. I really appreciate what you guys are doing. A great bunch of young guys. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, sir. Ron Scharf is a U.S. Navy veteran of World War II and a veteran of the battles of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. I'm Greg Corumbus for Veterans Chronicles.